Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Visiting Writer Series in uh, Block 5, our first of 2022. Um, and thank you all for, for coming in, and I hope you're staying warm as well and safe. Um, so I'm Natanya Pulley, I'm in the English Department, and the, the Visiting Writer Series is sponsored by the Colorado College English Department with the support of the McLean Visiting Writers Endowment. Um, the Indigenous community of Colorado College includes CC students, staff, and faculty with engagement beyond campus and throughout Colorado Springs in the Southwest. Colorado College is located within the unceded territory of the Ute peoples. The original inhabitants of the region that is now Colorado include the nation of the Apache, Cheyenne, Pueblo, Shoshone, and Ute. And tribes whose territory sometimes extended into Colorado include the Comanche, Kiowa, and Navajo tribes. There are two federally recognized Native American tribes in Colorado today, the Southern Ute tribe and the Ute Mountain Ute tribe. And I know I've just rattled off a bunch of tribal names, um, but please remember that these people have and continue to share their stories, cultures, and agricultural and environmental knowledges, healing and strengthening ceremonies, and commitment to the land and earth we all live upon. I hope in inviting our reader tonight, the small glimpse of Diné knowledge and intentionality remind us of the diverse nations and the, their ways of living throughout these regions long before first contact. What we do with this knowledge starts by how we listen and does not end when we do. Our ancestors speak to and through us as does the future. And we can all be a part of listening and honoring the lessons we encounter, not just from people, but from the earth itself. So I wanna thank our guests for taking the time to be with us and creating a space for storytelling and the responsibility of being a storyteller. Our visitor tonight is Manny Lowley. Manny writes fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. He's currently a PhD candidate in English and Literary Arts at the University of Denver. Um, he's a dedicated member of various literary and writing communities. The pro he's a program coordinator for Six Directions Indigenous Creative Writing Programs through Lighthouse Writers Workshop, which is in Denver. And he's the director of the Emerging Diné Writers Institute. He's also a member of the Diné Writers Collective and um, his, his publications include the Pleiades Magazine, Massachusetts Review, Santa Fe Literary Review, Broadsided Press, the Yellow Medicine Review, and the Diné Reader, which is an anthology of uh, Navajo literature. And I actually am gonna put that in the chat. Maybe that didn't go to everybody. Here we go, there you go. Um, he's currently working on a novel, which is titled, They Collect Rain in Their Palms. It's my honor to introduce Manny, whose reverence for storytelling is limitless. In all his writings and teachings, we see his dedication to the stories of humans and creatures, but also nature and landscape, water, time, dreams, and reverberations. When Manny speaks to the process of writing, he speaks of a humility and presentness essential to being a creator of narratives and words. The power of putting into words one's existence is an accepting responsibility of balancing things both creative and destructive. And Manny's stories share grief and fear as well as hope and happiness. And there's little difference in the tear of his narrator than the rain above him. Like prayer songs and gravity, how we enter and live in spaces on this earth and form the stories we are meant to share and how we choose to understand ourselves as poets, storytellers, singers, record keepers, and educators. I learned so much from Manny, whether I'm reading his work or listening to him talk or teach, and in all the opportunities I've had to get to know him better. So I'm excited for each of you to hear from him tonight as well. So please join me in welcoming Manny Lilly. Thank you, Natanya. Uh, yeah. Um, Natanya's clan is Kia'ani, and one of my clans, my Nella's clan is Kia'ani. So Natanya, I refer to Natanya as Shanella Asa, or my paternal grandma. So thank you, Natanya, for inviting me and for having me here in Colorado Springs. Thank you to Colorado College. I, I really appreciate it. Ah, you see, I um, so to begin, I'm just going to introduce myself in, in my language, in our language, um, and then we'll get things started. Um, 
Twidditch Eden dash a chedo, Kiani dash a nulle. Nlaid set ha to gole, will yenigi de a yesinasha. A conde nle zil chink the chi dask anade, de a yesi cashed eh. The laganic etch aya many lowly dash a jinne. A cut on a hokati in the nanchle. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Salt Clan, born for two who came to the water. My maternal grandparents are the bitter water and my paternal grandparents are the towering house. I reside in a place called where the water flows through the rocks. Um, more specifically in that community, I live below a mesa called Red Nose Mesa. Um, in English, my name is Manny Lowley and that's how I identify as an earth surface person. Thank you. Before I, before I begin the reading of my own work, um, I wanna do a knowledge recognition. So along with recognizing the land as, as um, Natanya did so eloquently, I also wanna recognize um, the knowledge bearers that I learned from, the cultural knowledge bearers and, and the people that have influenced my own work. And so I offer gratitude to not only my ancestors who survived genocide in the face of colonization, but I also offer gratitude to my family. My family are the most gifted and wondrous storytellers without even trying to be. So I, I thank my, my grandma, my mom, my aunties, my uncles, and all my literary ancestors that have came, come before me and that continue to teach me. So thank you to Lucy Tapahanso, Laura Tohi, Nia Francisco, Della Frank, Roberta Joe, Rexley Jim, Ophelia Zapeda, Simon Ortiz, and many, many more. Thank you to my friends and my family who mentor me in language and in Diné ancestral life ways. Thank you to my language teachers, Andy Nez and Kwana Yazi. I can't for all that you've taught me. And so I wanted to read several things uh, this evening. So I'll, I'll kind of be, as Rexley Jim says, all over the place, and it'll be your job to make some sense out of the material. <laughs> so um, the first thing I wanted to start with was an excerpt from my novel manuscript. Um, a part of the novel was published in the Dinner Reader, um, but I don't want to read that, that, that piece. I'm going to read something different. So let me pull that up and then we shall get started here. Okay, so the, the piece that I'll be reading um, is, is towards the beginning of the novel um, when the two love interests meet each other for the first time and kind of all the anxieties that, that come along with that first meeting, especially being um, gay on the Navajo Nation. Um, the novel takes place um, in 2005, shortly after the Navajo Nation passed um, a law that does not recognize same-sex marriage on the reservation. So even today, the state of New Mexico recognizes same-sex marriage, but the Navajo Nation continues to, to withhold that um, from its people. And so I'll, I'll read uh, a piece of that. Otinch, carrying the prayer stick. Natani descended the hill into Smith Lake. Sparkling droplets reflected off the hood of his old Ford truck. In the distance, Miltzamba'ad, female rain, moved north towards Crown Point, her translucent hem draping the earth, making everything anew and vibrant with the smell of liveliness. Further down, Nadani could see the cars lining the highway. There were gigantic pickup trucks, cars with mud caked on the sides, and SUVs whose, tired, whose tires weighed a ton. Surrounding the lineup was lush green rolling out over hills and mesas. Honeyed patches of sunflowers swayed in the June breeze. Monsoon season in the high desert brought plenty of rain, quenching the earth's thirst and replenishing the rivers of Natani's youth. Later in the evenings, frogs would croak their throaty songs while earth red water curved around and curved around and spilled into arroyos. As Natani neared the caravan, he saw people running down the stretching line, attaching bundles of colorful yarn to mud splattered mirrors. 
Skeins of red, blues, pinks, greens, yellows, and whites hung like fuzzy fruit waiting to be picked. These yarn offerings would later be collected by teenagers and younger children. Not Ani slowed to a crawl, cranking the cheap plastic knob to lower the driver's side window in search of his family. His grandmother warned him to be on time. She spoke with firm assuredness. You'd better get to Otinth around noon to get a good spot. Nadani simply nodded yes, afraid of getting a whipping even at the age of 21, and changed the topic to something sunnier, like their next trip to pick day on the mole hill of a mountain behind their home. But time moved differently in their homeland. Sometimes it was viscous, like moving through honey currents, and other times it rushed like a river, moving everything along until Nadani washed ashore, wondering what happened with all their time and whether he took advantage of all the small moments. Today was a honey current kind of day. Even the bees and flies hovered lazily alongside the highway, floating between scraggly bushes from flower to flower. Further down the line, Nadani spotted his cousin Bertie. She was the daughter of his eldest aunt Debbie, but he recognized her as his sister. Her real name was Alberta, but everyone called her Bertie since they were children. She became Birdie so naturally that Nadani forgot what sparked the change. Maybe it was her quick movements and how she could never sit still. Hey, brother, Hadish Nanand, eh? Masana was looking for you, and man, she looked pissed, Birdie laughed. She drove by earlier, heading down that way. She pointed her lips somewhere behind her. Abinda Nanjojde Nashant, eh? I had to run into town to pick up some donations, Nadani said. Well, you better find your mom and get in line before Graham catches you. She had that same face, like that one time we thought we could outrun, outrun her, remember? And that old whip she used to carry, you know the one. And we hid behind that wood pile, but she caught us anyway. Man, that took me back, kind of scared me too. They burst out laughing and Nadani continued his drive down the line. He found his grandparents near the middle of the lineup. His mother and younger brother, aunts and uncles and family friends flanked his grandparents' massive truck. Nadani's grandmother sat low behind the steering wheel. Her face was serious. Masana, get in line, she snapped. I can't, she shook her head. I don't want to hear it. We'll talk later. The line is about to move. Natani squeezed in behind his grandparents' truck. He waved one of the yarn people over, and two bright pink bundles were strewn on his mirrors. All around, the sounds of excited chatter and honks chimed. The sounds that to Natani meant home immersed him in a sauna of memory he never wanted to leave. Otinth was a part of Natani's favorite summer tradition, the Nda, or enemy way ceremony, enacted to heal those returning from war or anyone recently returned from serious surgical procedures. He had enjoyed it since he was a child, the excitement of community gathering, families returning to the res from the dirty hustle and bustle of cities like Phoenix and Albuquerque, the light-hearted, warm feeling of coming together. The laughter of his cousins and siblings as they splashed in puddles, their skinny legs caked with reddish-brown mud until their parents herded them back to their respective vehicles before the caravan departed. Shoo! Stop playing in that puddle before you get a leg ache, parents chided. I don't want to hear you complaining later. Now, the thundering of hooves gliding over sagebrush and prairie dog hills added to the summer song. Just as much a part of Nda as the old song stretching from the emergence into this world to the present moment. Young men astride robust quarter horses 
speckled Appaloosas, splotched pintos, roans and sorrels, whose, quote, whose coats gleamed like the newness after summer rains, descended the hill behind the line of cars. Each horse outfitted in their ceremonial best with gleaming silver studded bridles, fresh saddles rich with the smell of new leather and hand woven saddle blank blankets from the looms of grandmothers, wives, sisters, aunts, and mothers. Some of the men whooped and hollered, enjoying the summer sun and slight breeze, basking in their power and strength. The herd of horses and men slowed to a steady stride as they neared the caravan. Nadani noticed a young man in a deep burgundy shirt, like the shade of interior canyons folding into sunset. A dark blue jeans and moccasins, a jawed old turquoise necklace stood out against the young man's chest. A silver concho belt with nuggets of turquoise reflected sunlight in all directions at his waist, and a flowered turquoise bandana held a river of jet black hair from the young man's face. His athleticism was clear from his ride, and he sat erect with one hand calmly splayed on his thigh. He rode steadily past, casting a sideways glance at Natani. Natani was still, captivated by the young man's smooth motions and assured confidence atop his beautiful horse, this strong man who emanated sturdiness and gentleness, the subtle exposure of delicate skin beneath his neckline, the way his thighs clung to the horse and flexed with each stride, each new and nameless thing that Nadani felt heightened as if dormant for years somewhere deep deep in Nadani's marrow and flesh. Nadani continued to gaze after the young man until he disappeared over the next hill and he remained still, letting each new discovery ripple beneath each layer of him, listening to his steady breathing and the thrum, thrum, thrum of his heart like a weaving comb padding along loom strings until eventually he named this reverberation desire. And so we're going to fast forward a little bit. So they're at the ceremony. They, they have met, seen each other from afar. And now um, they're going to actually, they're going to actually meet each other. So I'm going to go to that part now. In the clearing. Not Ani parked in a semicircle alongside his family. They were a mixture of sporty cars, old Ford trucks with rust stains and cracks in their windshields, boxy SUVs that his grandpa laughed about, calling them microwaves, and flashy sedans covered in reservation mud. The children formed groups with siblings and new friends to wander through the camps of various families, looking for snow cone vendors and places to play tag or hide and seek. In the West, Laughter and singing reverberated from within shade houses of the hosting families across the clearing with the hogans at the center. The juniper and pinyon trees surrounded the clearing like a belt, their spiny leaves softly singing in the breeze, adding their own blessing to the ceremony. Sin nahatahat khash. Isn't it beautiful? Nadani's mother said. Her maroon shawl flapped in the melodic current. She sighed and turned to Nadani. Something on your mind, Shiesha? Nadani shook his head. Not really, he said. I don't think he's anything to talk about yet anyway. You know, she continued, I first saw your father at Nda. He looked so handsome riding, and when he asked me to take a walk that same day, I didn't hesitate. What are you talking about? Nadani's mother smiled and looked at him over her sunglasses. I saw the way you looked around when we first got here. Nadani crimsoned. I should help the others unload. He turned, but his mother caught his arm. Be, oh, caref be careful, okay? His, her eyes were serious. These young cowboys might be cute, but you never know what they'll do after having their fun. Adahodya, stay alert. 
Nadani nodded and turned back to help his uncles, cousins, brothers, and grandpa unload the tables and tents while the women unpacked blankets and twin-size foam mattresses. They would spend the night camped near the bristly harbor constructed from juniper branches where the evening and morning meals would be served by the host families. Each visiting family would oversee their own pots, pans, and eating utensils. Nadani's family would eat around a crackling fire beneath a darkened shawl scrawled with the Milky Way and the holy bodies of the twelve constellations dancing around Nahokos, the star at the center of the Dene universe. In the morning, they would gather in front of the Hogan, sing to the dawn, and receive goodies of Shasta sodas, small bags of chips, popcorn balls, cracker jacks, pouches of juice and fabric, all in celebration of their return to Hojan, and their voices would rise in the unison from the earth, from the land that shaped their ancestors into clouds thick with voices from a long time ago down into fresh memory, showering the earth in the colors of dawn. And this will be the last, the last part. It's, it's pretty short. Searching. Not Ani stood quietly near the blackened fire pit, his face lit with dusky orange light. Its warmth lapped at his skin and the crackle mixed with laughter and excited chatter, spots of light flickering on the skirt of desert blackness. Young men in crisp button-down shirts and blue jeans huddled together, sharing stories and making enough noise to attract any of the young women dressed in matching blouses and tiered skirts with turquoise and coral jewelry shining in the firelight. Smoke curled between them, obscuring their curious glances before wafting into the speckled night sky. The sound of drums and singing mixed with the chirp of crickets in the tree belt line. Nadani paid little attention to the singing. Instead, his eyes searched the visible areas around the fire for a hint of the young rider. Did he join the ceremony simply for the joy and freedom of the ride? Or was he partaking in the dancing and laughter at another nearby camp? Nadani hadn't seen him at the evening meal, where he volunteered to fight through the crowd of people to fill pots and pans with stews, different kinds of bread, mutton ribs, all for a chance to look for the rider dressed in sunset burgundy. Now, with the darkness laying down over the hills, valleys, and mesas around them, it was harder to search. Nadani figured it was better to stay near his siblings, especially Bertie, his childhood protector. One does not go wandering in the dark alone, his grandmother would say. His mother's warnings were not lost on him either. Nadani's mother was a cautious woman. She often called him with stories about hate crimes she read about or heard about from her friends. Even when the subject was serious, his mother told her story in her animated storytelling voice, the one she used to get her audience's attention, the one she inherited from grandma, from her mother. They found his body on fire, burning all of him to nothing. It was near the city dump. Some say he met a cowboy type at a bar in town and went with him. Once they finished their business, which I don't think anyone should do in the back seat of a car, the cowboy strangled him and then set him ablaze. He was only 22 years old. Times are crazy. Promise me you'll be careful. Okay, Shiaja? In the past year, murders of gay men happened frequently. Before Nadani returned home from college, a distant uncle went missing. After an extensive search, his body was found in a ditch deep in the McGaffey forest, naked, with dirt overflowing from his mouth, the essence of Earth's life-giving power used to take one of her children's lives. Nadani shuddered, and the singing continued. 
Seated next to him in a shimmering purple blouse and flared skirt, Bertie nudged him on the arm. Something on your mind, brother? Nadani shook his head, just thinking about what mom said earlier. She told me to be careful. Auntie worries too much, Bertie sighed. You know how she gets. Sometimes I wonder how she was able to leave the reservation for college anyway. Bertie looked at Nadani. Besides, there's nothing to worry about as long as I'm here with you. Don't forget who used to kick your ass all the time when we were little, she smiled. How could I forget who also got into the most trouble, Nadani laughed. Shoo, I'm not a troublemaker anymore, she giggled. Yeah, tell that to the guy over there. Nadani nodded his head across the dancing fire. He hasn't stopped checking you out since we got here. Bertie turned her head and took a sip from her blue ceramic mug. She shook her, her head. He's worthless, one of those womanizers. He sure is cute, though. She rolled her eyes. What about you? What about me? You know, are there any guys you're interested in? Nadani snorted. Even if I am, he's probably straight or a homophobic closeted asshole. Well, if it helps any, you look nice tonight. She hugged him. Nadani wore a dark blue shirt like the outlines of distant mountains and a four strand turquoise necklace hung down his chest. Deje, Nadani said. Nadani returned his gaze to the darker edges of the gathering space. He longed to see the young rider, at least for a moment, and bask in the warmth he felt before. He ached, yearning to know the feeling of skin, warm from the summer sun and wind, of want and hands roaming the inner slopes of him. But Nadani was used to not getting what he wanted. His reality wasn't like that. Doubt and suspicion held him back. These are the nights they dream of, Bertie stretched her arms behind her head. Those people in Sedona and Santa Fe, all those new age hippies and their vortexes. They wish they could taste a bit of what we have out here. Nadani followed her gaze upward. The Milky Way's body stretched clear across the vast night sky, imprinted on the body of Yadashish. It seemed like magic, something from the before time like their ancestors' vision and essence was bottled up and within reach. Their moment was interrupted by a girl in pink. Bertie, come sing for us. Bertie stared at her. What do I know about singing? Nadani squeezed Bertie's forearm. What do you know about singing, Is? Are you kidding me? Because she used to sing when they were kids herding sheep in their valley, Bertie could not refuse. Nadani leaned closer and whispered in her ear, you want me to find a man, don't you? Then maybe you can sing him into being. Fine, she said. Find me a drum. Once she had a drum, she tied her sawney scarf to it and wore it like a necklace. A few minutes later, Bertie stood in the south, her dress winking in the firelight as she softly wrapped the drum. The fire seemed to dance with her rhythm and the perfume of de steaming from mugs mixed with a gentle breeze carrying hints of pinyon and the sweetness of orange moonlight broom. And she sang, Everything blurred into one another, like wind shifting sand dunes of many colors. Young men drifted from their friends to the other side of the fire and held their hands out for young women to dance. Show uo 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 huskye. Show uo 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 huskye. Would you like to hold my hand and dance with me, my darling? Would you like to hold my hand and dance with me, my darling? Clay bigger, chef is just a gesto layes. Clay bigger, chef is just a gesto layes. Hey, ee, 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 Near the song's end, as the dancers twirled with multicolored skirts whooshing in circular motions, he emerged from the west. 
the young rider with his slender and athletic build, long and delicate fingers, soft eyes, and long dark hair that seemed to blend into the night. Nadani expected to see stars streak throughout his long rivulets. When I see you again, when I see you again, it will be like tasting sunshine. It will be like tasting sunshine. Hey, e a e a e a e a. Hey, e a e a e a e a. He came into the firelight. Nadani didn't notice the song's end, nor Birdie calling his name, but only the young rider. Then Anderson. The name rang sweet in Nadani's ear, flowing down his shoulder and settling somewhere in his center. Nadani's stomach was warm. It rested there and fluttered when the young rider looked in his direction, Anderson. The girl threw her arms around Anderson's neck. He lifted her with no effort and spun her around. They stood together, smiling. Nadani's chest hollowed. They look good together. He is so happy to see her. Nadani, didn't you hear me? Bertie stomped in front of him. He was glad to be interrupted. Sorry, uh, I got distracted. Bertie followed his gaze and understanding was in her eyes when she turned back around. I see. I don't think it's anything, she said, a little smile on her lips. I'm going for a walk, but I'll be fine. I won't go far. Bertie watched Nadani shrink into the darkness his mountain blue shirt dimming until she could no longer see him. And so that's the only section that I'll read um, from my novel manuscript. Um, and now maybe we could take a break in the kind of like reading lineup and see if anybody has any questions. And if not, we can continue on with some poetry. Natanya, what do you think? I love that idea. Yeah, if we want to uh, take a second. Um, and I think we have the chat or the questions available. It looks like we don't have Q&A, so let's use the chat. OK. OK. Um, I, I mean, I have a question about the, the music and how you've incorporated it um, on the page and what it looks like. Um, and also, you know, what the kind of choice that you made to, to sing it to us and to have it there, like when you're writing it, do you, did you think of the song or, or did you think like, how am I going to represent the song? Or did you think like this song has to be in the, in the text itself? <clears throat> so song appears a lot in my writing. Um, there, there's actually a teaching behind that. Um, so in, in, a, in Diné epistemology, at least, at least what my grandparents say, is that when you're looking for inspiration or when you're, when you're trying to call upon a, a creative energy or a creative force, um, it's good to offer something because knowledge doesn't come for free. So when we offer songs and when we offer prayers and when we make offerings, it's kind of like a request to whatever entities are out there that, that gift us with imagination, that gift us with voice, that gift us with, with words and stories. And so when I was writing that scene, I was thinking about um, that about songs, about songs that I know and songs that that surround me on a daily basis. And that song is actually, um, it's a song and dance song, right? It's a song that you sing at song and dance. And in certain ceremonial settings, um, there are dance, there is dancing that takes place and it's, it's more fun and lighthearted. And that's why that song was more like of a love song, right? And I think the notion of, of what um, Birdie says, or what Nantani says to Birdie. He says, you want me to find a man, right? So why don't you sing him into being? Why don't you call him here for me? 
And so at that moment, when she starts singing, Nadani's love interest manifests. He comes into the scene and it's almost like she called him, right? And the purpose behind that is throughout the novel manuscript, I equate Nadani and Anderson's relationship to, to relationships like male and female rain or changing woman in the sun and in these different deities that have romantic relationships. And so their own relationship seems faded or it seems like it's destined to be or it's something older than, than the contemporary moment. And so, yeah, that was a little bit about my decision to, to sing. And I also enjoy singing. I, I collect songs wherever I go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I have a question from Brandon um, and he's referring to the talk you gave earlier today about the spirit line or that tiny imperfection that's woven into the Navajo rug. Um, and he's wondering how that spirit line manifests in your writing, um, if there's an aspect of your writing that is analogous to that, to that kind of, um, I don't wanna say escape, but a uh, path, right? Path out of a text, path out of being trapped in a work of art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, for those that may not have been um, in my talk earlier today, I talked about, I, I used the example of a storm pattern rug. And in, in various rugs, there are these, these imperfections that exist that, that some call a, a spirit line, right? And the idea behind a spirit line is that when the weaver is weaving the rug, because they're pouring so much of their mental faculties, their thinking, their emotions, even some of their spirituality with songs and prayers, because they're pouring all of that essence into the rug, there's the potential for their mind or their spirit to get trapped in there. And so because in Danette epistemology, the idea of perfection doesn't exist, there's no such thing as perfect. They, they include a spirit line, a tiny imperfection that, that will allow their spirit or their mind to, to continue to have an escape out of that object that they're weaving. And so this applies to, to all kinds of, of Diné crafts and Diné artistry. And, and the same is included for, for creative writing, for storytelling. And you see this in, in the oral storytelling through multiple versions of a story. There are, there's no one single version of, of a Navajo story. There's multiple versions. And so the way that I practice this is that I also have multiple versions of a story. And so sometimes I'll read it one way at one reading, and then I'll read it another way at another reading. And it all depends on, on what, how I'm feeling about the things that I want to include. So some of these versions will not have the song. And some of these versions will have the song based on my own inner context about the mindset that I'm approaching the page with, approaching the reading with, about how I'm feeling, about what happened that day, right? And so that's kind of my way of, of trying to not um, be in this realm of the perfect, because there's no such thing as perfection. The other thing that, that I experiment with too is, is this idea of mystery. Within Western mindset, Western mindset is uncomfortable with mystery. We always, in a Western context, we have to find evidence. We have to answer the big questions. We have to test boundaries. But within Diné epistemological thought, we have to be comfortable with mystery because as human beings, we aren't the pinnacle of all creation. We're only a tiny speck of it. We're only a tiny speck living in this greater force that is the natural world, that is the natural law of the universe, right? And so, yeah, so that's, so, so sometimes in my own work, I leave questions unanswered. And sometimes an audience member might, might ask, oh, what happens with this? And sometimes I'll respond, I don't know, what do you think happens with it? So there has to be some, some sort of comfortability with, with the unknown. I, I love that. And I also love that, you know, your answer suggests that everybody has to find their own kind of spirit line in their own writing, right? Like their own style of way of doing it so that it makes sense to them, right? Um, whether it's reading it differently, printing it differently, or 
um, as you just said, you know, leaving these moments unanswered. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, we have another question from Henry and he wants to know what your process is for choosing names for your characters um, and how much symbolism goes into character names in your writing. Mm. Mm. So there's a lot of symbolism um, when the names are in Navajo, right? So, so the, the main character, his name is Natani, right? Natani. And Natani translates to leader, right? To a leader. And so I kind of decided to name the main character in that sense because he, he demonstrates leadership in all sorts of ways. And sometimes they're not as obvious as what you would think a leader is. One of the way that he demonstrates leadership He's not afraid to be out, even though his mom tells him all of these stories about gay people being dismembered, about gay people just subject to all sorts of violence on the reservation, which actually happens. Like if you comb through the newspapers for the city of Gallup, if you comb through the independent newspapers, there are headlines like that where, where these gruesome things happen. And so despite that, despite all of those potential dangers, he, he kind of takes it upon himself to, to walk that path and to be out and to, to um, have this relationship with this other man on the reservation, right? Because one of, one of the markers, at least in Navajo thought, is that a leader takes it upon themselves to, to do the thing that is dangerous. Even in some um, Navajo like prayers, when they reference leaders, some of the, the phrases that they use for leadership translates to like a person that doesn't turn around from danger or a person that doesn't um, yield to adversity, right? That's, that's some of the definitions of a leader. And so that's, that's one of the symbolisms behind um, the main character named Nantani. And then there are, there are other names too, like several of the women characters, like what one of them might be named like uh, Nana Ba, right? So that, that name Ba, um, a lot of Navajo women, Navajo girls, they have that name construction of ba. And kind of like the, the symbolism behind that is that one of the first warrior in Navajo um, stories was a woman. And that name ba means warrior. It means, it means a woman that, that fights, a woman that, that is a warrior. And so I use that name construction in my, my piece later on because all of the women in my life, my mom, my grandma, my sisters, they're warriors, they're tough women. Like my grandma, um, I remember one time I had gotten stuck in the mud at our house because our house gets really muddy. And my grandpa wasn't home and it was just me and my mom and my grandma. And my mom was, and my, me and my mom were kind of like, oh, we're just gonna wait for grandpa to come back. We're just gonna wait for grandpa to come back. And my grandma puts on her mud shoes and her big coat and she's like, what do you mean wait for a grandpa to come back? We're able-bodied. We have, we have strength. We can do this. And so we went down there and we were able to get my vehicle out, out of the mud. And that, that's because my grandma, she's, she's a, a tough lady. And so, yeah, that's just a little bit about names. Name, names carry importance. Um, yeah. Um, I, I never had Ba on my name, but... My my grandpa called me Natana Yaja, <laughs> Natana Yaja, <laughs> a little a, a little leader, um, or brat, I guess. <laughs> um, so I I think I just had one other question about the humor that I that I'm picky, that I pick up in your your novel because there's so many funny parts um, and such love between the characters and and their um, their relationship where they can be teasing, um, where they can push at things, but also be loving at the same time. Um, I mean, it's a careful balance, I think, between your characters, but then also with um, that humor that's being shared throughout, especially in those moments where um, something is potentially violent or difficult or something like that. And I, I imagine that just is you, right? And, and your style and, and who you are and how, how it comes across on the page. But do you do you think about that when you think about your your reader as um, what they find um, humorous or what they find 
um, or like where they where they find that that joy. Hmm. And um, is it a Navajo reader, right? That's going to pick up on a lot of those things. So whenever I write a poem or whenever I write a story, my primary audience in my in my head, I think about my cousins. I think about my siblings. I think about the younger version of myself that would have wanted to read a gay Navajo story. Because growing up on the reservation, like my family, we grew up in a, in a, in a trailer that had no running water. It was out there in the middle of, um, I don't like to say it in the middle of nowhere because in our thought, our home is in the middle of our universe. It's in the middle of everything. But out there in the middle of, of away from capitalism, away from de development, right? Um, it's lonely, it gets lonely sometimes. And, and you don't have these kind of like role models um, to teach you about, about what it means to be gay or about whatever, that kind of thing. And so my primary audience are, are the people that I grew up with is, is people that, that have a similar background to me. So that's why some of the lines too, when I insert dialogue that's in Navajo, I don't translate it. Sometimes I'll put context around it, like in the English prose that accompanies the dialogue, but sometimes I, I won't translate it. And my thought behind that is like, if people wanna know, they'll have to ask an Apple speaker or they'll have to, they'll have to look it up. <laughs> um, but in terms of humor, we talked a little bit today in my talk about trauma, about how to approach hard subjects. And we talked about healing. And a part of Diné epistemological thought is that stories are involved in, heal in healing. In, in, in almost every, well, in every Diné ceremony, it begins with a story. It begins with, with the medicine person asking you, what happened? Tell me what happened. And when you tell the story, you don't skip any details. You tell it exact because the smallest detail could let the medicine person know, this is the type of healing that that person needs. This is what can restore that person to harmony and to balance. But it's hard to do that because some, some things are hard to talk about and, and, and it can trigger you. Like when I was writing this, this piece about, about these, uh, the violence that happens, it, it triggered my anxiety. And so when I, um, write about traumatic things, I always try to in incorporate buffers. I incorporate protections for, for not only myself, but also for my reader. And one of those protections is um, humor, is laughter. Because um, in, in, in a lot of indigenous cultures, laughter is medicine. Laughter is, is a part of the family dynamic. It's a part of the ceremonial dynamic. Whenever you go to a ceremony, even if you're talking about a serious spiritual stuff and everybody's all serious, eventually someone will crack a joke and then everybody will laugh and the laughter becomes a part of the ceremony. The laugh, you welcome the laughter, you welcome the positivity into the space of the healing, right? And so if I view my writing as a healing space, as a healing container, as a, as a space that contains multiple energies that are kind of converging with each other, right? Laughter is gonna be a part of that. I want people to laugh. I want people to, to have some sort of positive feeling. And so that's kind of my, my own personal thinking is that it's a protection for my reader and for myself, because my responsibility is not only to myself as a storyteller to get famous off of my story. That's not, that's not what it is. It's, it's a responsibility to my reader to impact them in some sort of positive way. At least that's how I think of it. Thank you. Um... I don't see any other questions. Did you want to, to move to some poetry? Yeah, I'll, I'll share like two or three short poems um, and then we can, we can close out and it'll be right. good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so like I said, we, we, we talked a lot about some uh, violent stuff and all that kind of stuff. So maybe I'll read some poems that are more, um, I don't know, positive. So the, the poetry that I do lately, um, I've been really interested in, in language revitalization, right? Because I'm not a fluent speaker of Navajo and I accept that, but I am working very hard to, to become a fluent speaker. Uh, my grandma growing up, she only spoke in Navajo. 
My mom switches back and forth between Navajo and English. My aunties, they all switch back and forth um, between Navajo and English. And so I wanted to write poems that my grandmother could engage with, right? Because she only speaks Navajo. So I started writing these Navajo poems and something miraculous happened. So when I read my Navajo poems to my grandma, she, she becomes my poetry teacher. She, she doesn't know anything about Western concepts of poetics because she only went to school up until the, the sixth grade. But she knows a lot about Diné poetics, about Diné aesthetics, Dinetics, as, as my friend Jake Skeet says. And so when I read a poem to her in Navajo, sometimes she gets a puzzled look and she says, what are you talking about? And then I'm like, I try to explain it. And then she corrects it. She, she rearranges some things and she says, okay, try it like this. Or if there's a more poetic way to say it, she, she says that too. And then so, so we riff off of each other and I'm able to learn from her in that way. So my best poetry teacher is my grandma, my grandma that only speaks Navajo. Okay, so here is uh, one of my poems. I'll read it in Navajo and then I'll, I'll translate it to English. Tahitango <laughs> And now in English. Remembering a crescent moon. Tonight, a crescent moon. My grandmother told me when the moon is a crescent, it cradles snow, it cradles sacred songs, it cradles ceremonies. Like the basket of life, the moon holds these things. Within hallowed darkness, a crescent moon floats. Clouds obscure the moon. Everything is darkness again. And so that poem is, is an ode to, to what the moon has to teach us, but it, it's also an ode to darkness. And, and the funny thing about, about the difference in Diné epistemology and, a, and kind of like a Western influenced epistemology that's influenced by Christianity is that darkness in a, in a Navajo context, darkness is, doesn't mean evil. Darkness means it's a sacred entity that I referenced as chahal And so darkness is a part of healing. Like at night when it's dark outside, it's not a scary thing. It's a rejuvenating thing. In the darkness is where we sleep, right? At night we sleep and we rest our bodies. And so that's kind of the, the idea that I was playing with um, in, that, in that poem. The next one is, is, um, is another Navajo poem, first in Navajo and then in English. Dag ehte. Dag ehte ta'at an yigad. Ye godot ish inayil. Nil tsampa ad yil jol shada a te na da nda ina nil tsampa tand le te akot ao nda ina akaz nest ao se tso tradedin be dark ete nil tsa ayoke. Now in English. In the cornfield. In the cornfield, corn stalks rustle deep green with life. Female rain glides from the south. The corn moves about for the rain, an old dance from the beginning. Tassels gold with corn pollen catch rain in the cornfield. There's a, an old cornfield that is located um, east of, my, of our house where we live in, 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 in uh, the community that we live in. And my mom told me a story about when she was a little girl, her great grandma on her dad's side 
all she would invite all her family to to collect the the corn pollen from the cornfield and to collect the corn itself and they would make a big old day out of it because the cornfield is huge and so you would have to have all kinds of people helping you out and so they would start in the morning and they would be collecting it and and doing all the things that they need to do and all the while all of these relatives they're singing some people are making food to feed the people that are that are preparing everything and then the kids are playing and the dogs are running around and it's a very um it's a very communal type of thing and somewhere along the way we, we stopped doing that my, my family stopped doing that but my brothers and i because we have my nephew my first nephew my yet my son my nephew we started um we restarted that tradition so every year on mother's day um uh, me and my brothers we plant corn and we plant squash and all manner of, of vegetables to honor my to honor the earth itself because the earth the earth is our mother as well, but also to honor my 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 mom and my grandma and our aunties and so we do that every year so so the pandemic has brought about some some positive things as well, even though it's kind of hard to think about it like that. It's brought about this kind of cultural resurgence that's happening and for, for us it's taking the the, the way of corn. And so that's that's a little bit about that poem. Um, I'll do two more. I'll do two more. First in Navajo and then in English. Dodle biyin sad la Rexley Jim bits on bitish ja. Hodeya da dolly hat has jinne bit ah dot isn't eh. Hail Kango, Nahadlingo, Dodge Ish. And Lades is Kake, Dole Yet Ako, Sisna Jinne Haseya, Ade the Yendene, Big India, Ade the Yendene, Shich and Hadzi, Bizar E, Nadan, Bitsiga, Yeradgo, Tradedin Be, Ahojon Go, Nahadlingo, Shich and Hadzi, Get Show, Eason Sang. Sisna Jenny Picago, her Jean Shet a hot eh, D. Be Nansa, D. Be Nashed Zil Dolish, D. Be She in Nashed Dolish, D. Be Naho Jean Dolish. And now in English. Bluebird song with lines from Rexley Jim. At emergence, Bluebird was singing with deep blue wings like dawn rising. Flying near the mountain's crest, Bluebird called out. I ascend White Shell Mountain. At the summit, I come upon the holy people. At the apex, the holy people speak to me. Their language is corn tassels dancing, corn pollen all around, beauty and harmony restored. Like this, they speak to me. Be still, listen, can you hear it? On White Shell Mountain, I am whole, peaceful. With this, I return. With this, I will be strong. With this, I weave my life into being. With this, let there be oneness. And I'll end with uh, one more uh, poem in Navajo. So just bear with me as I pull it up. Okay, here goes. So this poem was published on uh, Broadsided Press. So if you visit Broadsided Press, it is available for free as a broadside that you could print out. And so first in Navajo and then in English. Tchadadin bazad. Dag eh asnito tchadadin bazad aditz a. Da ad a yiradgo. Hush, hush. Da nigo nahatin go. Bedajitni Da at a the ne hojoni yet, do pitch it a huinanigi, bedajitni Tradadin bazaar, ye sanko, shena ishna Shenak ished ho nahtin Dag a asnito, tradadin bazaar, a as hojet, hojanastli in English. The language of corn pollen. From the center of the cornfield, the language of corn pollen sounds. When the corn stalks rustle, as they say, whoosh, whoosh, 
in the wind. They remember the rain. They remember our beauty and our hurt. The language of corn pollen moves within me, woven into mountain song, dawn song, my name in my mother's voice. My tears are raining. From the center of the cornfield, the language of corn pollen makes everything beautiful and harmonious. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manny. Um, it's such a beautiful reading. I have in the chat here a, a link to the, the broadside if anybody wants to, to take a look at it. Um, but thank you again for, for, for joining us, um, for sharing so much with us and uh, for reading both prose and poetry um, and, and for just being here. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, this will be this is a, will be recorded and available on the uh, English Department Visiting Writers Series site. Um, and next week, you can join us uh, hopefully in person at uh, Taylor Hall with the Speakeasy uh, group for an open mic. Um, so stay tuned for more of that. Thanks, everybody. Stay warm and stay safe.